Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Today the webinar will be hosted by my colleagues Nate Grates and Brandon Bell. Nate is our field service engineer and Brandon is our process engineer. Both engineers have worked with many customers and with their technical exposure, they've compiled recommendations on the best practices for the best results. If you prefer if you refer to the right console for this webinar, there will be a feature where you can ask questions. Feel free to ask any questions at any time, and at the end of the webinar, we will select a few to share with the rest of the audience. This webinar will also be recorded and provided at the end of this week for those who want to go back or share with a friend. Now, without further ado, here is Nate and Brandon. Uh, so first off, we're going to go over some of the features of the VROC Initium, which is going to be the key product that we're going to focus on today. Uh, so some of the highlights would be that it's a autonomous viscometer, so all measurements are automatic. Um, there's a f either a 40 vial rack or 96 well plate, which allows you to load up multiple samples and then have them run automatically. Um, there is a requirement of 20, only 26 microliters per sample, so this is microfluidics. Uh, the, the Initium also has a sample retrieval and recovery feature. The retrieval feature allows you to rerun the same sample possibly an infinite amount of times, and the recovery feature allows you to take the sample that you just tested Put it back into a vial for further testing. There is also a built-in Peltier temperature control unit. Uh, this allows for measurements to be taken from anywhere from 4 to 70 C. And then the sample rack where your samples sit is controllable from 4 to 40 C. You are also able to control the unit's uh, shear rates at which it's testing. Uh, this allows for shear rate sweeps to get Newtonian versus non-Newtonian features. And there's also temperature control for temperature sweeps. So a little bit about the VROC of the VROC Initium. It's our core technology. It stands for viscometer and rheometer on a chip. It's a hybrid of microfluidics and MEMS which is a microelectronic mechanical system. Uh, it's comprised of the MEMS sensor, which are silicon uh, <clears throat> pressure sensors um, on a microfluidics glass chamber. Uh, this allows for measurements of absolute viscosity. Uh, the chip itself only requires at least 10 microliters of sample to run through it to get a full measurement. Uh, depending on the chip style that you have, you can have a wide range of different shear rates and flow rates. Uh, it's a through-flow system, so there's uh, allows for a high throughput, and there's a high amount of repeatability with 0.5%. Uh, so that's a basic overview of the VROC Initium, but now we're going to get into the meat of the presentation, which is the, we're going to focus on the first half is going to be the high quality results you can get with the Initium. Uh, this is going to include a repeatability study, um, a intrinsic viscosity study to accentuate the accuracy of the unit, um, how you can use it for sample differentiation and quality control. We'll go over some Newtonian and non-Newtonian characteristics and a temperature sweep. Uh, and then after that, we'll go over some of the best practices you can use to get these high quality results. These being proper sample preparation, proper solvent selection, chip selection, choosing a flow rate, preventative maintenance, and our clarity software.
Okay, thanks, Brandon. Um, so this is Nate here. I'm going to be going over uh, some of the results that Brandon was talking about just a second ago. Um, so kind of tying this into the, the best practices. Um, so if you, you know, use the best practices that we recommend, um, you can get results similar to the ones that we're going to be showing you today. So this is just kind of showing you, um, you know, what's achievable with our instrument. Um, so the first thing we have here is uh, repeatability study to see how well um, we can repeat the measurements of a well-known viscosity standard that's MGBS100. Um, so you can see on the right here um, that over the course of 50 measurements, the actual readings don't vary much more than 0.1 centipoise. Um, so this is less than 0.5% repeatability. Um, so along with this, you might be thinking, well, that's going to take a lot of sample volume to achieve. Um, so with the VROC Initium, we actually have a feature called sample retrieval. Um, so what this does is it actually runs the, the instrument in reverse. Um, so what I mean by that is it pulls back the sample through the flow channel after it's already been measured. Um, and then that allows you to remeasure the sample by pushing it through one more time. Um, so with that in mind, you can essentially pull the sample back and push it through the flow channel again, unlimited times. Um, so this allows you to really um, characterize your samples uh, with very small sample volumes. So another study that we've done um, is an intrinsic viscosity study with BSA. Um, so the reason intrinsic viscosity, or first, I, I guess we can talk about what intrinsic viscosity is for those of you who aren't familiar. So intrinsic viscosity is a measure of the solute's contribution to the viscosity of a solution. Um, so in this case, the, the sol solute would be BSA, bovine serum albumin. Um, and the solute, uh, I'm sorry, the solvent would be uh, PBS. Um, so using the intrinsic viscosity, you can determine the molecule's hydrodynamic radius uh, when the molecular weight is known. So um, it's another method for particle sizing. Um, so if you look at our study on the right here, um, you can see that the R squared, or we have two different equations that we use to fit the data. Uh, one being the Huggins equation, that's this top one uh, with the red data. And then below that, we have the Kramer equation. So that's with the orange data. So you can see we actually got very good R squared values for this data. Um, the Huggins being around 0.96 and the Kramer um, also being very high. Um, so with this, we are able to calculate in this table below the Huggins constant, the Kramer constant, and we compared it to the reference data to the right here. Uh, and we got very similar values for both of these. Um, we also compared the intrinsic viscosity that we calculated from the study to the reference value, and you can see it's also very close. And then last but not least, we have the hydrodynamic radius at the bottom here. Um, so using uh, some of the practices that Brand's going to talk about later, we were able to generate um, a high-quality study like this. Um, so I just kind of want to talk about, so this is another intrinsic viscosity study that we did with a different uh, molecule. Um, the reason I want to bring this one up is just to show you the uh, resolution that you get with um, your testing. So um, the VROC technology brings accuracy and precision to your measurements, so that way you can get high quality data. Um, so you can see here on the right, we um, had four different solvents that we were testing for bovine gamma globulin, um, and we measured each of those solutions as a, while varying the concentration to see how the viscosity changes. Um, and you could see that with these two middle trends here um, that the data is actually very close, but we're still able to, um, there's a clear difference between these two trends. So that kind of just shows you the uh, precision that we have with um, our measurements. Um, so this could also be a very effective tool for quality control applications. Um, it, even if there's 
So if a small change in viscosity can affect your manufacturing process, this would help you detect those changes and prevent them in the future. Um, so just depending on what your application is, um, you know, measuring the viscosity can be a very effective tool for quality control. So next, um, you can act also uh, determine if your sample is Newtonian or non-Newtonian, um, you know, using our instruments. Um, so the figure on the right is a comparison of commercially available eye drops. And what we did here is we varied the shear rate and measured how the viscosity changes as a function of shear rate. Um, so part of this study was to show um, how, you know, over a wide range of shear rate samples can behave differently. So with some of these trends, like this orange one here, you could see it's actually somewhat Newtonian, uh, may, maybe very slightly shear thinning at first. And then as you increase the shear rate, it exhibits stronger shear thinning, shear thinning behavior. Um, whereas other eye drops are Newtonian throughout the whole process. Uh, and it, so if you looked at this in the lower shear rate range, you might not see this full um, spectrum of data and you might not get a full idea of um, how your sample behaves with uh, shear rate. So this is, it's very important to measure your samples over um, a wide range to fully characterize them. Um, so some of the things you could tell are if it's Newtonian or non-Newtonian, um, if the samples are shear thinning or shear thickening, um, and how they behave in different regions. So, some, so in, below a certain shear rate, it might be Newtonian, and above that, it could be shear thinning. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at is uh, some of the temperature sweeps that you can complete um, with our instruments. So the temperature sweeps allow you to look at the viscosity as you vary the temperature. Um, and this can be very important for manufacturing processes because the temperature might be different for different points of the manufacturing process. So if you're filling syringes, you could be keeping it, uh, you know, the room at 18 degrees Celsius where um, during the actual manufacturing uh, or synthesis of a molecule, you could be running it at 25 degrees Celsius. So just depending on um, what temperature you're looking at, um, it's very important to characterize the, the samples over a wide range of temperatures. Um, so the figure that we have here is a melting point study using VSA, um, and we're comparing it to its formulation buffer. So you could see on the graph that at about 62 degrees Celsius, um, it starts to shift um, and go. So instead of the viscosity decreasing, it starts increasing at that point. And if you look, and if you compare that to the buffer, um, you could see there's a quite a difference there. So the buffer keeps decreasing in viscosity, whereas the the protein starts increasing, and that indicates that the melting point has been reached. Uh, so this isn't just um, applicable to proteins. Um, there's a wide variety of applications where you would want to look at um, how the viscosity changes with, as a function of temperature, such as uh, with oils, um, oftentimes, um, and with oil processes, the temperature is going to be elevated. Um, so this helps kind of fully understand your sample. So the last thing um, that I'm going to be talking about is just a system suitability check. Um, so this is something that we like to do before, uh, we, we check standards before and after testing our samples. Um, so system suitability, the definition for that is, it's the checking of a system before and during an analysis of unknowns to ensure system performance. Um, so essentially you're just ch checking to make sure that everything is running as it should be um, and that you're actually able to um, record a, a viscosity value that's similar to that of an expected value. Um, so usually you would use a standard uh, to do that. So picking a standard is also unique to your application. So um, just depending on what you're measuring, you're going to be needing a different standard uh, for, to target a certain viscosity range. Also, uh, knowing if this, the standard is oil or water-based is helpful. Um, if your samples are water-based, oftentimes you're going to want to use a water-based standard just to kind of mimic uh, 
your samples um, and vice versa. If you're running organic samples, um, oftentimes you're gonna wanna choose an oil standard um, just to kind of reduce your cleaning times and all that. So um, I'm gonna pass it back to Brandon now and he's gonna go over some more of the best practices. All right, so first thing I wanna start off with is proper sample preparation. So the first thing I always recommend is any piece of equipment that's going to come into contact with your sample, we recommend that you air dry it uh, out to make sure that you get rid of any dust or fibers that could potentially clog the chip, but also remove any debris that might interfere with your recordings. Um, we also recommend using a positive displacement pipette to transfer all your samples. Uh, this uh, reduces the amount of contamination, but it also allows for more accurate volumes, especially when you're dealing with such very small volumes. Um, once the sample is loaded into the insert, we recommend that you centrifuge it for at least five minutes at 10,000 RPMs. Uh, this helps remove any bubbles, and that's very important because if a bubble passes through the instrument doing a measurement, it will drastically affect your results. And, but the most important takeaway is to always consider the fact that the V-Rock Initium utilizes microfluidics. So even the smallest little bit of debris or contamination has a huge effect on the reading that you get at the end. So it's always important to consider even the smallest amount of variations. Um, the next thing is you wanna make sure that you're using the correct solvent for when you're uh, cleaning the Initium. So as of right now, the Initium has two different configurations. There's the soap aquet um, setup, and then there is the buffer setup. Uh, soap aquet is used for any aqueous samples, and buffers are used for something that's not aqueous. Um, if you're using buffer, we recommend that whatever buffer you're using for your protein or whatever sample you may be using, to make sure to do a quick solubility test to make sure that the your sample is soluble with whatever buffer that you're running. And then what no matter what buffer you end up using, uh, we always recommend to make sure that all your solvents are filtered. This will help maintain the life of the unit by not clogging chips with any debris. Uh, the next thing you always want to make sure to do is make sure you're using the correct VROC chip for your measurements. Um, so some things to consider when deciding which chip to use would be um, what's the viscosity range of your samples, um, what desired shear rates do you want to test at, and what are the particle sizes of your samples. So for example, um, the BO5 chip has a max viscosity uh, of 1,000, and you can go up to a max shear rate of 20,000, but if you wanted to go at a higher shear rate, you'd want to use something like the EO2 chip. Um, but the BO5 also has a max particle size of 5 microns, while the EO2 only has 2. Uh, the next thing you want to consider is what flow rates you want to measure at. So this is something Nate already talked about a little bit, but if you can see here, if you were to run these three different samples, one is an imitation syrup, one is a real maple syrup, and one is a, a mixture of the two. If you were to run it, or let's say around 80 inverse seconds, you can see that the viscosity is very similar, but if you were to run it out here at like 6,000 or 600 inverse seconds, the reading that you get is much different. So choosing the right measurement protocols that use the correct flow rates is a huge consideration uh, when picking how you wanna measure your samples. Um, something that we recommend and that we do a lot of the time in-house is to first run the sample on automatic mode. The unit will then uh, pick a flow rate that is give you the most accurate result for the machine and then after you see what the viscosity is there you can then maybe do a shear rate sweep to get a full characterization of your sample. Uh, 
Uh, the, next, the next thing to help you get the best results is proper maintenance and service of your unit. So there's the, quite a few consumables that need to be replaced on a regular basis. You can see the use counts for those on the left table. Um, some of the more important ones are the injection septum. You can see it has 400 uses we recommend to replace. So if you want to keep your unit running smoothly, we recommend to replace these on a regular basis. And the Initium software will also tell you when it is time to replace. Um, another way to get the best results is to maintain a service maintenance plan. Uh, this allows you to know that your unit is running smoothly, whether it be the chips being calibrated and repaired on a regular basis. Um, we also have annual inspections and preventative maintenance. If your unit was to ever become damaged in some way, we perform repairs. We also allow for training and software upgrades, um, protocol development, um, but most, of, most importantly, um, having a maintenance plan allows for a longer lasting unit that will provide you with confident results and peace of mind. Um, next, the best way to get best results is with our Clarity software. <clears throat> this is a like separate piece of software uh, that allows you to further analyze the data points that you get from the Initium. Um, this is because not every data point is valuable for your analysis. Um, there might have been a bubble or a contamination. And with the Clarity software, it is fully capable of helping you figure out which data points are good and which ones are bad. And to just get a better, what we call, fingerprint of your data. Uh, you can also use Clarity to easily graph things, whether it be shear sweeps, temperature studies, and even the intrinsic viscosity calculations, like the one Nate showed earlier, was done with just a few clicks of a button using the Clarity software. So that is it for best practices. But just to summarize what we went over today, we went over the capabilities of the VROC Initium with high repeatability and accuracy, sample differentiation, and Newtonian versus non-Newtonian behavior. But to get these best results, we have these best practices of sample prep, cleaning solvents, choosing the correct chips and shear rates, maintenance and service, and our Clarity software. All right, so uh, we're going to answer some of the questions that have been submitted now. Um, so the first one we have here says, what do RioSense engineers do to check miscibility? Um, so what I do when I'm looking uh, to check the miscibility of a sample as a solvent, uh, so I'll pipette a small amount of the solvent into a vial or a tube, and then uh, take a little bit of the sample that you're planning on testing and drop it in um, to, the, to the solvent and vortex it to see if you see any precipitates forming. Um, so it's just a matter of mixing the samples and looking to see if any solid particulates are forming and that they actually mix and that there's not two separate layers uh, that are forming. Um, so next we have uh, for VROC Initium, could we use different types of chips similar to NVROC? Uh, Brandon, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so the as of right now, the VROC Initium has three different chips. There's the BO5, CO5, and EO2, all capable of different viscosity ranges, particle sizes, shear rates, uh, but we do have further ones in development. 
the next question would be, how often do you calibrate the chips? Yep, so we recommend calibrating the chips once a year. Um, so the way that works is you would just, um, you know, reach out to us. We would help get you set up with shipping instructions. And then you would uh, ship the chip in and we can, uh, then we would calibrate it here and send it back to you. Um, so next we have, is Clarity compatible with MVROC? Uh, Brandon, I'll let you. Yeah, so uh, we actually just developed a new version of Clarity that is now compatible with MVROC. So you can now export data from either the Initium software and MVROC software into Clarity. Uh, we just got a new question. What is the highest viscosity that can be measured with the system? Uh, that is dependent on the chip you're using. So if I can go back, you can see here, um, potentially, if you have a CO5 chip, you could go up to 5,000 centipoys. Okay, well, that, uh, unless anyone has any other questions, um, that will be concluding our webinar today. Um, as always, feel free to reach out to us if you ever have any questions or uh, want to learn more about uh, measuring viscosity. Um, so, again, I'm Nate, I'm with Brandon, and uh, thanks for watching.